After traversing the dark caverns deep below Hyrule Castle, Link and Zelda stumble upon the mummified remains of an ancient evil, the demon king Ganondorf who tormented the kingdom of Hyrule in an age long forgotten. After snapping out of his age-long slumber, quite literally, the demon king wastes no time. Before even uttering a single word he goes on the offensive, launching a double volley of bright red malice aimed straight at the protagonist. The first attack cripples Link's arm and steals his vitality, and the second takes out the legendary master the sword, shattering it into pieces. At the conclusion of the encounter, the Demon King conjures up a third blast of miasma, this time aimed straight at the ceiling, after which the underground chamber starts to crumble. Ganondorf disappears into the void below, leaving Link and Zelda to deal with the dangers of the collapse. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to our heroes below ground, a much bigger event is taking place on the surface above. Hyrule Castle starts to fall apart. Its upper levels are ripped from the castle's foundation and start to rise into the air. As the camera pans out, another anomaly is seen taking place. Mysterious chunks of debris, big and small, emerge from the clouds. Trailed by a green energy, the exotic debris falls from the sky and crashes into the surface of Hyrule, as eyewitnesses look on in fear, confusion and disbelief. An event which would become known as the upheaval. But what exactly is the upheaval and, perhaps more importantly, what caused it? The easy answer would obviously be Ganondorf, right? I mean, even the newspaper claims that the Demon King is the root cause of the upheaval. But we can't just put our trust in the mainstream media now, can we? I mean, look at them, they're still searching for Princess Zelda, despite the fact that everyone and their mother knows she's a dragon by this point. Still, the way the game presents the event does make it seem like it was all orchestrated by Ganondorf in some way. In fact, the upheaval parallels a similar incident that took place not too long ago, the Great Calamity, an event so devastating it almost wiped out everything and everyone in Hyrule. The similarities between the Calamity and the Upheaval are evident. Both incidents started at Hyrule Castle. Both are connected to Ganondorf and his malice. They were prophesized in ancient writings, and each had far-reaching consequences which affected most of the kingdom's populace. But when you dig a bit deeper into the Upheaval, you'll start to notice that not everything is as it seems. The Calamity was pretty straightforward. Hyrule knew it was coming, took the necessary steps to prepare for it, and Ganon, using his own knowledge of the past, launched to counterattack by corrupting their technology and turning it against his adversaries. With the upheaval, it's a different story. Over the course of the game, many different causes and effects are attributed to the upheaval. Therefore, it cannot be viewed as simply one single event, but rather a collection of many different events taking place at the same time. Some that benefit Ganondorf, while others seem to actively work against him. As you'll see over the course of this video, there's evidence that suggests that some of the stuff that happened during the upheaval was planned by someone a long time ago. Someone other than Ganondorf. Which, if true, could give us a bit more insight into some of the history following Ganondorf's imprisonment. So join me as we take a deep dive into the secrets of the upheaval. Let's start with a good old-fashioned definition. In English, upheaval can mean two things, a violent or sudden change or disruption, or an upward displacement of a part of the Earth's crust. Both meanings are definitely fitting, though the second one is a bit more specific and doesn't cover the full scope of the event. After all, it's not just the Earth that's affected, but other factors as well, like the sky, for example. In Japanese, the word used for the upheaval translates to natural disaster or cataclysm. While I do think the word upheaval was a clever choice by the localization team due to its double meaning, the second definition regarding the displacement of the Earth's crust is not applicable to the lore behind the event. Not just because of the Japanese version, but you can also tell from the English text that upheaval is simply being used as a synonym for the word disaster. For example, when talking to the Rito about the legend of the Stormwind Arc, they mention a different kind of upheaval that struck their people long ago. A time when the wind stopped blowing and the heavens grew lifeless. With that said, let's get into the details behind the latest upheaval taking place in Hyrule. As mentioned before, there are definitely aspects to it that are unmistakably Ganondorf's doing. The rise of monster activity and the emergence of new monster types, for example. Or the sudden decay of swords, spears and other weapons used for offense. Eyewitnesses described that during the upheaval, tendrils of gloom spread across Hyrule and latched onto their weapons, making them decay rapidly. Aside from being a convenient plot device for the fuse mechanic, it does make sense that Ganondorf would want to 
disarm the people of Hyrule. It's made clear that the Demon King, while in his mummified form, is in a weakened state and spends most of the game hiding deep below the surface, gathering his strength. As such, crippling Hyrule's offensive capabilities prior to his true comeback is a good strategy. Then there's the four regional phenomena, and I think it's safe to say that Ganondorf is behind all of them. The storm in Hebra, the pollution of Zora's domain, the sandstorm in Gerudo, and the, uh trafficking of narcotics in Goron City are all connected to him, be it through Phantom Zelda or the four bosses who guard one of the secret stones. Ganondorf admits that he created or at the very least resurrected these monstrosities to do his bidding, made more obvious by the explosion of gloom when they perish. But then there's all the other, more suspicious effects of the upheaval, many of which don't seem to work to Ganondorf's advantage at all. To illustrate what I mean, let's take the Stormwind Arc as an example. We know this ship has existed for a long time, long before Ganondorf ever came into the picture, so it's not like he created it. I think we can all agree that it would make very little sense that Ganondorf would want this vessel to appear. After all, it clues the protagonist in on the location of one of the secret stones, and yet it conveniently shows up right after the upheaval. For Ganondorf's sake, it would been far better if the Ark remained hidden. I mean, the Rito themselves had long since written off its existence as nothing more than a children's story. Now, if Ganondorf's goal was to obtain all seven stones and become immortal or something, it would have been a different story. But the stones don't seem to work that way. As far as we know right now, the lore establishes that an individual can only possess a single stone. They cannot be sought out and combined like the Infinity Stones or the Dragon Balls. So logically speaking, the only thing Ganondorf can really do in this situation is to obscure and obstruct in order to prevent other others from obtaining the stones before he is fully recovered. And you'll notice that that's kind of a running theme in Tears of the Kingdom. Things conveniently appear or become accessible which contain vital resources or information regarding the history of the Demon King, the Sages, or the location of a secret stone, while Ganondorf tries to prevent Link and his friends from getting to it. This applies to almost every major effect of the upheaval. While the chasms may look like they are Ganon's doing, given all the gloom, on the flip side they also give the protagonist access to a wealth of information Zonai technology, and most important, the location of two of the seven secret stones. In one instance, Ganondorf goes out of his way to plug up the chasm inside Death Mountain's crater, seemingly to prevent Link and Yunobo from accessing the lost city of Gorondia and obtaining the secret stone that resides there. Many of the caves that opened up due to the upheaval just so happen to contain shrines, which allow Link to purify his afflicted arm and regain his vitality. And there's so much more. The appearance of the Sky Islands, Zonai structures on the surface that rose up from the ground, and perhaps most mysterious, the hieroglyphs that magically showed up all across Hyrule, which not only reveal what happened to Zelda, but also show Ganondorf's ability to take on her appearance, which is obviously not something he would want people in the present to know about. All of these anomalies are confirmed to have taken place during or as a result of the upheaval, a chain of events that was seemingly planned ahead. Another great example are the ring ruins who crashed in and around Kakariko village. If not for these ancient monuments, the existence of the fifth sage would have been lost to time. Yet here they are, conveniently up for grabs. And once again we see the same pattern of Ganondorf trying to obstruct one of the puzzle pieces, this time by tricking the researchers to stay away from it. If anything, it shows that the sky debris crashing into Hyrule was not his intention and so he improvised. The emergence of the Sky Islands also has no direct benefits for the Demon King, nor do they seem to be part of his end goal. As for the hieroglyphs, the ancients knew about their existence and even went as far as to map them out for future reference. The map shows that Hyrule Castle had already been built by this point, which must have happened sometime after Ganondorf's imprisonment. After all, the purpose of the castle was to seal off the underworld and with it the imprisoning chamber where the Demon King's corpse was being kept. Speaking of which, let's move on to the next and probably most iconic part of the upheaval, the rise of Hyrule Castle. This is where, for me at least, the first signs of something bigger started to emerge. Because when you think about it, the castle rising up has little to no bearing on Ganondorf's plans either. Heck, the castle barely even serves a function in the story at all. In Breath of the Wild, Ganon turned it into a heavily guarded base of operations, but in Tears, not so much. The only significant thing that happens after it takes to the sky is Phantom Zelda trying to bait Link in into the sanctum for a fight to the death. But the castle didn't need to rise into the air for that. If anything, it made it more difficult for Link to access the sanctum. Then there's the massive pillar that protrudes from the underworld. As we all know by now, the castle isn't actually floating as many of us initially thought. It's resting on a big central column. The column itself isn't just natural rock either, and instead has man-made features to it. There's engravings on it which are Zonai in origin. It suggests that this pillar is part of a mechanism that was deliberately built into Hyrule Castle back when it was first 
first constructed. For what reason, we don't know for sure. I mean, sure, the castle rising could just be a show of dominance by Ganondorf and nothing more. A way to crush the Hylians' morale by attacking their most iconic landmark or something. But I don't know, in terms of motivations, it just doesn't fit very well. First of all, the castle is in the exact same state as it was in the previous title. That is to say, completely trashed. Aside from a few temporary guard posts on the bottom levels, it hasn't been touched since. Which shows that it wasn't being used for anything and apparently restoring it wasn't exactly high on the priority list. Just like the other castles, the castle's rise also has a flip side to it when it comes to Ganondorf's goals and motivations. It actually exposes his underground hideout, making him more vulnerable to a counterattack while he's still healing. I really fail to see what Ganondorf has to gain from all of this. Which brings us to the final segment. How exactly was the upheaval triggered in the first place? What is it that set the whole thing in motion? In order to find out, we need to go back to where it all started. Deep underground, inside the imprisoning chamber. And this is where things start to get interesting. The rise of Hyrule Castle, as well as the falling sky debris, didn't start until Ganondorf hit the ceiling of the cave with his malice. More specifically, this part of the ceiling, which has the shape of an upside down pyramid. Judging from the position on the map, this pyramid is situated right below the massive column that pushed the castle up into the air. If you revisit the chamber after the opening segment, it's no longer there and seems to have moved up into the ceiling. Which leads me to believe that the column and pyramid are physically connected to each other. As mentioned before, the column has engravings on it that correspond to the Zonai. We see similar patterns all over the place, like in Raru's throne room, for example. The same goes for the spires that protrude from the walls of the imprisoning chamber, as well as on the upside down pyramid. However, unlike the column and spires, the pyramid has a secondary decoration on it, one that seems to have been placed on top of the original Zonai engravings. In game, these are difficult to see because of the lighting and the limited camera angles, plus the fact that it's no longer there after the intro, making further investigation impossible. However, However, thanks to a Discord user called Magic Pixie Dream Girl, I've been able to get a hold of the raw 3D model from the game's files. And here, the decorations can be seen clear as day. They are constellations, and if you're familiar with the lore of Breath of the Wild, they will no doubt look familiar. They're almost identical to the constellations seen on the Shika technology. I've searched high and low, and to my knowledge, there's only two pieces of Zonai architecture in the entire game that feature constellations, the other being the inside of those big floating spheres up in the sky. However, these constellations look quite different from the ones inside the imprisoning chamber. They've been carved into the stonework as opposed to being placed on top of it, and their overall art style also differs. Not to mention, their presence here makes more sense when put into context with the inside of the sphere as a whole. It simulates a day and night cycle with the sun and clouds on one side and the moon and stars on the other. The fact that we find constellations inside the imprisoning chamber, which are so similar to the ones the ancient Sheikah used, can't be a coincidence, especially considering that there's a giant Sheikah-made astral observatory right at the heart of the castle. Or at least there used to be, I don't know if it's still there now. Another interesting aspect is the name of this model, which reads Field Object Opening Field Purification Unit A01. So according to the game's files, it's a purification unit, which is quite fascinating for a variety of reasons many of which are for another time. We do have somewhat of an idea of when this purification unit was created, which must have been shortly after the imprisoning war, around the same time the construction of Hyrule Castle started. Because when we look at the end of the memory where Ganondorf is sealed by Raru, you'll notice a few differences between the imprisoning chamber in the past and the one in the present. For starters, the bodies of Raru and Ganondorf have been moved from the edge of the platform to the center. And secondly, the purification unit is not there yet. It's just a rock ceiling. The only things that already exist in the past are the platform and those protruding spikes on the wall. So here's what I think. I think that some of the islands in the sky and Zonai architecture on the surface may have been directly connected to the purification unit, which is actually very similar to how the Sheikah went about it. In both Creating a Champion and Age of Calamity, there's mention of a central control unit that exists somewhere deep inside Hyrule Castle, which is said to control and connect many of the Sheikah technology, most notably the towers. A bit like an electric grid. I guess. Heck, maybe this elusive central control unit and the purification unit are one and the same, who knows. Either way, I suspect that the purification unit was programmed so that when it gets hit with a high amount of force, it would trigger many of the events we saw happening during the upheaval. Most notably the stuff related to Zonai structures like the falling sky debris and certain buildings that weren't there in Breath of the Wild and allegedly rose up from the earth. And believe it or not, there's actual evidence that supports this. If you remember, at the center of the imprisoning chamber there's a circular platform 
platform, the one where Ganondorf's corpse was resting on. The moment the purification unit was hit by Malice, the platform fell down into the depths below. Which is something I found rather odd the first time I saw it. There's no debris hitting it, so why would it collapse? It felt very video gamey at the time. Turns out, it's not just a regular stone platform, it's actually a floating island. Once again, this is very hard to see in-game. Not just because of the darkness and fog, but the game triggers a story event the moment you try to venture too far from the entrance. And once you click OK, it's all cutscenes from there. But thanks to another bit of help, this time from Banoon, I was able to view the platform in Blender in all its glory. And lo and behold, there's a spire or antenna at the bottom of it, very similar to the ones found on the floating islands up in the sky. Whatever was holding this platform up must have been based on the same magic or technology that keeps the sky islands afloat. The antenna and platform can later be found at the bottom of the chasm, shattered into pieces. And because of its broken state and the gloom covering it, it was hard to determine its original shape. But now we know. The debris itself also reveals that the inside of the antenna is not made of stone, but rather some sort of green crystal, and you might recognize it from somewhere else. It's the same crystal that makes up those floating Zonai platforms Link can use. These platforms usually need an external power source in order to stay afloat. In this case, it's the battery Link carries on his hip that makes it possible. But some of the islands, presumably the ones that crashed down, as well as the platform inside the imprisoning chamber must have been drawing their power from somewhere else, which I think was the purification unit. Zonai technology is shown to be activated and deactivated by applying force to it, be it a hit from a weapon or an arrow or something like that. So what if the sheer force of Ganon's malice hitting the purification unit basically achieved the same thing, except on a bigger scale? It would explain perfectly why not only the chamber started to crumble, but also why debris started raining down from the sky immediately after. If true, it means that at least some of the sky islands like the ring ruins and Zonai structures like the entrance at Tobio's Hollow were somehow directly connected to the unit inside the imprisoning chamber, and I can't help but think that this was definitely done on purpose. To summarize, I think that Ganondorf was not the one pulling the strings behind the upheaval. Newspapers be damned. He was, at most, the catalyst that set the whole thing in motion, intentionally or unintentionally. The purification unit and castle on top were built after he was imprisoned, so I doubt he knew how it worked or what the exact consequences would be. My guess is that he acted out of pure rage and impulse to break free from the underground tomb he was condemned to for so long. Even though the exit is right there, but you know how villains are, they tend to break through walls and ceilings for dramatic effect. Using a door just doesn't cut it. The question remains, who set the whole thing up this way? Because we have to remember that the Zonai themselves were all gone by the time the construction of Hyrule Castle began. Raru is dead and Minoru went into hibernation inside the Pura Pad right before Zelda's draconification. Someone else must have picked up the torch somehow, be it the remaining sages, the ancient Hylians who survived the imprisoning war, or judging by some of the evidence, perhaps this is where the first of the Sheikah came into play. There are a lot of parallels between the Zonai and the Sheikah, too many to just be a coincidence. However, that's a topic that's way too big to cover in this video, so instead I will devote a separate video to the Zonai Shika connection. It's basically going to be a sort of part 2 to today's theory, so hopefully you will join me again for that one. A big shout out to Magic Pixie Dream Girl and Banoon for their contributions to this topic. Without them, it wouldn't have been possible. And as always, a big thanks to my Patreons and channel members. I'm happy to report that I've made a full recovery. No more pain, no more discomfort, so I'm ready to rock and roll once again. So thank you to each and every one of you for sticking with me despite my silence. And that is all for now. I hope to see you next time and have a good one.